First we have to cover how these flow curves are made and how to do a port development. You need a connection device to the flow bench, something like this bore adapter, to accept this whole thing as one unit. That is the test plate, the rotor housing, the rotor and the crank. Then on top of that you have to mount a degree wheel on the crankshaft so you can increment the rotor in steps. I use 10 crank degree steps. Then it's a matter of switching on the flow bench, adjusting the depression, take a reading and quickly write it down, rotate the crank 10 degrees and keep repeating that until it's finished. This was in 1999 so it was all handwritten. Now we have digital manometers with one button value recording so it's a lot quicker. It's about 30 flow tests per flow curve and with ported ports it's even more. A flow development is the same as that, only you take your whole jig apart, grind the part of the port that you think would increase flow, put it all back together and flow that. And that's what all these lines are. Incremental tests. On this particular development there were 20 tests, 30 points per line, which is 600 flow points tested. With piston engines you only have to do about 10 flows per test. But because it's got so many areas you have to do a lot more tests. In this full development of a 3SGE there's 42 inlet tests. 26 exhaust tests, then you have to port the whole head and make sure every cylinder is flowing the same as your developed port. Then if any of the cylinder's ports are flowing low, you try to port it and get it up to the developed head. And the same for the exhaust. And for this 3SG development, there was about a thousand test points. What are these incremental tests? You might cut a bridge from here to here and then flow it. Then you might add this section from here to here and flow it. And that'll tell you if that section has any influence in making power. Basically, if it does nothing, I wouldn't waste my time doing it. This is the short bridge port, and this is that 15mm extension. You can see again here, again along here, and again down here. To get even more pedantic, when you put the housing on the plate, it blocks half the bridge, like this section between the arrows. So you grind a chamfer in the housing from here to here, without cutting the o-ring. J-ports would cut the o-ring up to here. Monster J-ports, you would epoxy the water jacket and port it out to the second o-ring. J's are hard to seal because you need petrol proof sealer. And in this set of testing we tested different sizes of chamfers. No chamfer, 2, 4, 6, 8 and 10 mil chamfers. And here we can see there was a good gain from 2 mil to 4 mil, but the 6, 8 and 10 were quite small. This is a typical bridge port. I don't know who did this bridge port, but I'd never leave a radius on this corner because it chips side seals. You can see the problem of trying to extend the port timing when you haven't got any material behind the plate. Basically it's just shallow tapers. I don't have flow figures for this full bridge with the ported main, so I'll have to use the flow figures from this bridge development with the standard main port. I had already done a main port development with my mild port, so I wasn't going to duplicate it. And I really wanted to know what the bridge port slot does on its own. And if we look at the flow curves, this is the standard 12A turbo port all by itself. And if you look at this curve, it's the same standard secondary port but with a bridge added. Basically everything between these two lines was added just by the bridge. If the main port was ported, I'd expect this to be filled in. In the other video, I said the 12A turbo plate can do a lot more. And it's this flow curve up here when it's mild ported. The thing about the 12A turbo, it fools you into thinking it's not a good port because it has such a small port timing. But in actual fact, it has the most metal behind it in the water jacket, so it can be ported the most. Basically, you don't have to taper the port because it's all solid metal behind it. Hence why it can flow as much as a bridge port on its own. From the other video we saw the second report of the 6 port being very efficient, characterised by a bulbous turn and a small port runner area. Well my mild port development of the 12A turbo plate has a similar shape. From the top they are very similar and large turns. Basically the standard 12A turbo port has a more bulbous turn, meaning that the long side radius has been pushed out further, which is something you can never achieve in an RX-7 series 2 because the internal casting pattern is too small. Meaning if you tried, there wouldn't be enough port wall thickness for you to port it out without cutting into water or oil. Next we have a 6 port mile port. Here's a Cosmo 20B port for comparison. And you can fill in this much of the port without affecting flow. The 6 port mile port has the most flow, that's because when the ports are combined it's massive, but it's not an efficient port. If we look at the velocity curves, the 12A turbo mile port and the bridge port on its own flow the same and have the same runner area so their velocities are the same, but with the 6 port mile port, we can't shrink the port down enough to match the other two without losing flow, so its velocity is not as good. Basically the auxiliary port's shape is so bad you can't recover its efficiency. Lastly we have the peripheral port, and this flows a massive amount of air. Actually too much air. In the world of porting, we have a thing called flow horsepower, 
Flow horsepower is a simple equation that Superflow flow benches came up with to give you an idea how much potential horsepower you can make based on the flow. It's a simple equation, but its predicted horsepower is correct 95% of the time. Here we see this port flow 383 CFM, and if that was a four-cylinder, that would equate to 393 potential horsepower. If we reference Mazda's old horsepower figures, it's 310 horsepower for a 13B peripheral port with a Weber, and 350 horsepower for the mechanically fuel-injected version. Yet in this case, we have enough flow to support a 400 horsepower engine. As a sanity check for a 48 mil streamlined orifice, that's 2.8 square inches times 146 CFM per square inch equals 408 CFM, which is in line with the short straight bit of piping that this peripheral port was without the manifold. I don't know how accurate this is, but I found a guy claiming 300 wheel horsepower with a modern EFI peripheral port, which is around 360 to 380 flywheel horsepower. So maybe now they're getting closer to the potential flow horsepower. You can read about it in this last post here. As a sanity check, the 1990 Le Mans winning 4 rotor had 700 horsepower and 9000 RPM which is 350 horsepower per 13B, so if the guy's engine was designed to use a higher RPM it might be able to have a higher horsepower. There's also this thing called piston demand, or in this case rotor demand, which kind of makes these high flow potentials before top dead center and after bottom dead center a bit redundant. Basically there's not much airflow demand by the rotor at these points, so you don't need a lot of flow. It's more wave tuning differential pressure demand. It's probably more area dependent on communication of waves than flow dependent. So what is this demand? Basically calculations are done on 100% VE because 100% of the swept volume is the maximum the piston, or in this case the rotor, can demand. But when we factor in the volume change line, we see by bottom dead center we need 654 cc's for a 13B chamber to have been ingested by bottom dead center. And that gives the impression this line should be the shape of a flow curve. But that's not the case. There's an adage among porters, and that is, a good porter knows what his head flows at peak piston velocity, which isn't easy to work out because you've got to know the lift at that point, and that's because demand is dependent on the rate of change of chamber volume. And the fastest rate of change is around mid-stroke, and if we put that line in, it's like this white line, and it's the peak where we try to match the flow to the demand. Coincidentally, on a piston engine, peak piston velocity is just before mid-stroke. Depending on the rod ration, that could be 78 to 82 degrees after top dead center. Basically when the rod is 90 degrees to so the crank is peak piston velocity. And it's hard to satisfy demand of a piston engine because max lift is after this point. Going back to our rate of change demand line and doing some rough number crunching, a 4 cylinder with 654cc cylinders, same as the 13B, making 310 horsepower and 9000 RPM like a carburetted peripheral port requires about 290 to 305 CFM, which is way less than 383 CFM of this 48mm peripheral port. This white line is probably closer to what we need, at least if it was a piston engine. Of course you'd pad out the demand line with flow just in case, and add some flow area before top dead center and after bottom dead center for wave tuning. Possibly something like this blue line here. And this is the velocity of the peripheral port. Now let's add our 700 feet per second port speed limit. And that's this green line up here. And this shows this 48 millimeter peripheral port is not being fast enough. And if you notice there's a couple side port lines above it, on paper these curves look like they're going to be a problem in that they're above the 700 feet per second but these velocity curves are based on a piston engine demand meaning they're based on 180 degrees intake stroke rotary engines have 270 degrees of rotor demand meaning that the atmosphere has 30 percent longer to push the same volume through the same port meaning the velocity will be 30 percent slower which puts us well under the 700 feet per second limit Basically I did the equations based on the 180 degrees piston engine because 20 years ago I didn't know any better and now I'm too lazy to fix all these equations. When you factor in 30% slower for this peripheral port, that's 470 feet per second and that seems slow for a straight bit of pipe. Looking at these high velocity side ports again, rotary side ports are a terrible shape and it's not likely they can sustain 700 feet per second. So they are going to sonic choke at a lot lower velocity so they have to be abnormally large to account for it. Individually these side ports might be a problem but because it's two per chamber, i.e. double the area, the velocity might be low enough. Add to that the lower rate of demand and the velocity is even lower. If we go back to the 300 horsepower four cylinder, a safe critical cross section area will be about 2.2 square inches, whereas this 48 millimeter peripheral port has 2.8 square inches. So it seems too big for the application, at least compared to a piston engine. If the piston engine had a Formula One style port, it would only need 1.9 square inches. If we go by Mazda's usual 43mm peripheral ports, it's a lot closer. Another point of interest is SAE paper 900032, which is trying to improve the performance of the Le Mans engine by simulation. 
If we look down here at their inlet tracks and port dimensions and compare their 1970s peripheral port to their new optimized one, we can see they've reduced the port timing but increased the areas. They also increased their choke window from 43mm to 46mm. And on the next page we have the predicted and measured VEs. The 70s PRIF has a VE of about 113% at 8000 RPM and the optimized about 118% at 8500 RPM. But if you look at the disassembled motor in the Mazda Museum, it looks like it has the old 70s peripheral ports. So it looks like they went for drivability rather than peak horsepower. Going back to the previous page, we can see the effects of different cross-sectional areas of the intake runner. And we can see all the VEs are the same, just peaking at different RPM. This shows engines are port velocity limited. It's just that the larger diameters take more RPM to reach that velocity. You see this velocity limit factor in piston engines when you add a stroke of crank and keep the same top end. Because the small capacity engine and the large capacity engine will both make the same horsepower, just the large capacity one will do it at a lower RPM. Showing the engine ingesting a larger volume through the same size port will hit its velocity limit a lot earlier. And that's about it for rotary inlet ports. I do have some other graphs for when I was looking at this in 1999, in case anyone's interested, but I'll only go through them briefly. Here we have some exhaust ports, and notes say this is a 13B jet pollution housing. Maybe that's an RX-5, but I don't really remember. The purple line is that same housing ported. The yellow line is the same port but tested in a different manner, which I'll explain later. And the light blue is a 13B Cosmo, same as a 20B housing. There is no documented method to flow test rotaries, so I had to invent it. So if we assume this peripheral exhaust port is an inlet port, we would draw air from here. But when the rotor is at top dead center and squashed against the housing, it blocks the port. You have to draw from the other side of the rotor because the minor axis now becomes the restriction point or the minimum area. And it's this flowing the same port with two different methods that accounts for the two different lines. Now let's look at the inlet and exhaust flow curves in relationship to each other. Here we have a standard series 4 primary port, the port in the center plate. This is a standard secondary port. And this is the combined primary and secondary ports of a standard series 4, which shows about 215 flow horsepower for a four-cylinder. This is the peripheral port from the other graph, and this is the ported yellow line from the exhaust graph. The first thing we'll look at is overlap. And it's tiny compared to what you'd find on a piston engine. Basically a rotary has 19 more degrees from top dead center to bottom dead center. So it doesn't actually need this extra duration that a piston engine has. Because it can satisfy rotor demand without it. Standard piston engines are probably open 20 degrees before top dead center. For the peripheral port there's a lot more overlap. Which gives a lot more communication for wave tuning. Big cams for a piston engine might have an advertised opening at around 50 degrees before top dead center. And this is a series 4 engine if it was ported. And that's about 313 flow horsepower for a four-cylinder. Just as something interesting, Mazda gives you port opening area over crank degrees. And as we can see, that's quite different to what the actual engine sees with flow over crank degrees. The port timings are the same, but look at the peripheral port and then the side port. And that kind of shows port opening area is not exactly what the engine sees. Next, we can look at the slope of these lines, which is how fast ports can open and close. In a piston engine they try to achieve this square shape of opening and closing. But because of a limitation of the mass that the cam is trying to lift, they can only accelerate these parts at a certain rate. So they use a lot of tricks to try to accomplish this. You can see the gentler slopes in the cam profile. They would lighten all the cam gears so they can use ridiculously aggressive cam profiles. 15 years ago they put inverters radiuses in flanks to increase the lift velocity. But now they can achieve the same velocities without the prominent dip. And if that's not enough they use high rocker ratios. Over 2 to 1 rocker ratios are pretty common these days. Higher rocker ratios accelerate valves faster, but it also means you can use a smaller, less aggressive cam profile that doesn't lose control of the follower. In pro stock, they purposely lose control of the valve to make it open even more, and that's called lofting the valve. In engine design, you nearly always make more power when you lift the inlet valve higher, so pro stock uses the springiness of the valve train to try to throw the inlet valve beyond what it's supposed to lift. Pro stock would use a calculated 1 inch 50 thou lift. But when it's put in an engine with a thousand pound springs, it only lifts 980 thou. But when the engine is actually running, it would throw the inlet valve to 1 inch 80 thou. So what does all this flow mean in relation to the rotary? Well, I don't have empirical data, because back then the rotary engine was the low end of the market and owners didn't want to dyno tune their engines, especially the normally aspirated stuff. But for what we can see, the normally aspirated rotary engine is kind of similar, but different. Maybe it's directly related to flow and velocity like a piston engine just that it uses different values. Like maybe the 48mm ports and our peripheral port are making 400 flow horsepower. 
just that the combustion chamber is so bad it can't realise that 400 horsepower, meaning you would have a greater loss factor to be equivalent to a piston engine's calculations. As for turbo rotaries, I would also assume that's the same as piston engines, i.e. the ports don't have to be perfect to make power. As an example, this ported Series 4 made 500 rear wheel horsepower, which was pretty good for this budget engine at the time. But when we went to a dyno comp, all the serious engines from the other engine builders also made 500 rear wheel horsepower. We were doing 500 horsepower 15 psi and they were doing it with 25 psi. But either way, both were making 500 horsepower. So not really a technical advantage. That being said, they had secret custom dyno developed turbos that we couldn't afford, so we maybe could have done better. So even with all this port technology, it seems the limitation is mechanical strength, the capacity of the chamber and the tune. Maybe my ports on their setup would have an advantage, but with both having 500 rear wheel horsepower, there seems to be something else besides the port limiting the power. Here is a quick rundown of engines from 1999 to 2001 so that I have some information about. This port was used in two 12A turbos on budget cars, which used pump gas and a Series 5 turbos bolted on, and both made 300 wheel horsepower on about 12 or 14 pound boost. This is the flow for that port. I don't have flow figures for the primary port, but it'd be something a little bit higher than this yellow line. And when added together, that's about 290 flow horsepower if this was a four-cylinder. Next is Series 4 Turbo, ported for maximum flow. Despite the large port timing increase, there was a lot of ballooning of the turns to increase flow. I think this motor made 500 wheel horsepower at 14 pound, because at the dyno contest he asked if he should bump it to 16 pound to win his class. Either way, it was somewhere around the teens. This is the standard primary port of the Series 4, and this is them ported. This is the standard secondary port, and this is that ported. And these two flows added together make about 300 flow horsepower. This is the ported 13B RE Cosmo motor. This one I went conservative and only changed the port timing and smoothed out the bowl. It was supposed to be a civilized street engine, but I think this one made 500 wheel horsepower too. But don't quote me on that because my memory is foggy. People who drove it said it was a lot more grunty than the Series 4, so I assume it had more torque. This could be due to the conservative porting having more velocity on exit, i.e. acting like a nozzle port. This is the standard primary Cosmo port. This blue one is ported, standard secondary port, and ported secondary port. And added together, it's about 290 flow horsepower. As far as velocities, they're all roughly the same, except for my highly efficient 12A turbo mile port, and a couple of standard Cosmo ports down here. They do have overly large port runners, so you can see why. And that covers about everything I know about rotaries. And since now I've retired from rotaries, it's kind of up to you whether any of this information is useful.